attention to uh, a lovely description that we have of a, of a local church in the, in the New Testament there, in Acts chapter, mainly in chapter 11, uh, the church in Antioch. I really want to give a bird's eye view of the church uh, for our encouragement and for perhaps for our challenge. How do you distinguish a true church from a false church? We're still in a, a day when um, in our communities we, we have chapels and churches that are open. Uh, but the phrase that, uh, there's a number of phrases that strike me in this description of the church at Antioch. Um, but particularly uh, the phrase that um, comes in verse 23, where he describes Barnabas coming to the church when he arrived and he saw what the grace of God had done. He saw what the grace of God had done. I think that is really sums up um, a true local evangelical church. It's, it's a place where God has been working graciously. Uh, and there's the evidence to be seen and I suppose we, we, what we're going to be doing tonight is looking at that evidence of the grace of God. Of course, the church at Antioch was founded because of a period of persecution. That's why we read from Acts chapter 8. And Saul of Tarsus was uh, throwing his weight around, wasn't he? Uh, seriously persecuting the church uh, in Jerusalem and Judea and however as usually happens the church still grows in spite of the persecution it's interesting that the church grows in times of persecution and also in times of peace because we're told that after uh, Saul's conversion, towards the end of the same chapter, verse 31 of chapter 9, then the church throughout Judea, Galilee, and Samaria enjoyed a time of peace and was strengthened, living in the fear of the Lord and encouraged by the Holy Spirit in increasing numbers. So you see, in a time of peace, the church is able to make progress. In the time of persecution, the church is able to make progress. Uh, God is not limited by uh, peace or persecution in his work. Now, uh, I have usually taken the view that it's, that has often been commonly taken concerning those who traveled from uh, Jerusalem to Antioch. Uh, I don't know if you've heard this particular interpretation from chapter eight. Uh, verse 4, those who'd been scattered uh, preached the word wherever they went. Philip, he went down to Samaria, proclaimed the Messiah, heralding the gospel, clearly preaching to crowds of people who heard and saw the signs. Uh, whereas the, other, the phrase uh, earlier in, the, in, the, uh, in verse 4, preach the word, has often been interpreted as being gossip the gospel. Here were ordinary believers gossiping the gospel as they travel because of persecution to different locations. However, the more I've thought about this, I think that could well be true, and it would probably is true. In fact, I would say it is true. But I, I, I just feel that it was not the only explanation for what happens in Antioch. For this reason, you know that, that at the beginning of the description of the church in chapter 11 and verse 19, there were those believers who traveled and only went to the Jews to tell them the gospel. But then you've got these others. Now there's something about these others that is different. One is that they understand that the gospel is for Jews and Gentiles. They've grasped that. We saw this morning how Peter was having to struggle with that and 
and how he came to understand it. And so here are, here are some, some people who have grasped this fully and are willing to go to the Gentiles with the gospel in Antioch, a big city. It, when it was at its height, it was about 500,000 population, but I think by this time, it had settled down to something like, I say settled down to something like 200, 250,000 people. That's a huge community to go and preach the gospel to Gentiles where there was no church. And it seems to me that God had equipped those people particularly with a clear vision of gospel work. So I think that, yes, I'm happy to say that believers gossip the gospels and the gospel, and that's what we're all committed to do, uh, where we live, amongst our families, and amongst our colleagues at work. But I believe that there seems to have been a definite sense in which some of those who went had a clear vision of what the work of the gospel should look like. They knew it had to be established among the Gentiles. And I think it's, it can be understood in this way. That as, you, as you remember about these, these men that were set aside as deacons in Acts chapter 6, there were seven men. One of them was Philip, and God took him to Samaria to preach the gospel. One was Stephen, who we're told that the religious authorities could not stand up against his preaching. They could not, they could not take argument with him. They, their arguments fell to the ground every time Stephen opened his mouth. And so I believe that it's quite possible that God took hold of other people who were in the Church of Jerusalem who had a clear vision of what the gospel should look like in a Gentile context, that they began preaching the gospel as well as Christian believers, gossiping the gospel. In fact, should they not both go together? The evidence that we've become Christians is that we become concerned about others who don't know the Lord. And we want others to know the Lord and we will seek to take opportunities that God gives to. Oh, we fail so often. I don't know if you like me. I sometimes come uh, back to home and I used to say to Rachel, I, I just didn't know how to answer what somebody said to me. I just couldn't think clearly. And, um, but in, in those circumstances, we can commit the person to God, can't we? And ask that God will help us the next time we see them. And, um, but that's, that's what we're meant to be. We, we, there are those who are called to herald the word and those who are called to, to gossip the word. And that's how I believe this church was founded. And now I want to look at some of the characteristics that come out of this passage about this church. What's the evidence of the grace of God? in this church at Antioch? And what should be the evidence of the grace of God in any true church? Well, first of all, it's the spreading of the word. It's the preaching of the gospel, of the good news, verse 20. They began speaking to Greeks also, telling them the good news about the Lord Jesus. The Lord's hand was with them and a great number of people believed and turned to the Lord. I want to return to that verse to close our evening. But suffice for us to say is this, that this is uh, a most essential characteristic of a gospel church, that they, they are a living church. I'd say, I would say they're a living church. Everything I've got to say tonight begins with the letter L. It's a living church. It's a living church. Why? Well, because it preaches a living saviour, a saviour who has died, but has risen from the dead, and it preaches a living message, a message which is powerful and effective under the ministry of the Holy Spirit. It's a living church. It has a gospel to proclaim. One of our hymns says that. We have a gospel to proclaim. I sometimes turn on the service on Radio Wales at half past seven 
on a Sunday morning. I very often turn it off again within five or ten minutes of listening for half an hour. Occasionally you hear a gospel service and then the other times you wonder what you're hearing. And so clearly uh, the evidence of the grace of God is that the gospel is central. The gospel is being preached and it is changing people's lives. There are people who are hearing the gospel and being changed by it. They are hearing the good news about the Lord Jesus, that he is the Son of God. Why he came? He came to seek and to save the lost. Where he is now, risen and exalted in God's right hand. And this gospel turns people from sin to the Lord. It turns them around. It's effective. They experience a powerful change. God is at work in their hearts and their minds. Their hearts have been opened by the Lord to respond to the message. That ringing from uh, Paul's ministry in Philippi as he goes there. The Lord opens hearts to respond to the message. You see, that's a living church, a gospel church. Church that tells men and women they need to be born again of the Spirit of God. If anyone is in Christ in a new creation, the old has gone, the, the new has come. God has done a work in people's lives. It's a living church. That's the evidence of the grace of God, that the gospel works. The gospel works. People are brought from darkness to light, from death to life. That's the evidence of the grace of God. It's a living church with people who are alive to God, in fellowship with God and in fellowship with one another. Why else would we, as a group of people tonight, gather together if it was not for this central truth of the gospel? It's a living church. The evidence of the grace of God. The evidence of the grace of God, secondly, is that such a church should be a learning church. It's a learning church. It began under the ministry of the word, didn't it? So immediately, people began to learn the gospel, began to hear the gospel preached. And in this very brief description, in a sense, of this church, uh, we read that when uh, uh, Barnabas comes, verse 23, he arrives and saw what the grace of God had done. He was glad and encouraged them all to remain true to the Lord with all their hearts. What's he doing? He's teaching the church, isn't he? He's teaching the church. He was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and faith, and a great number of people were brought to the Lord. What's he doing? He's preaching the gospel. He's teaching the church. He's preaching the gospel. It was a learning church. Men and women were learning the faith. And when he goes to find Saul, to ask Saul to help him in the work, what, does, what do they do? They teach a large number of people. They continue. This is a learning church. A learning church. This is what Paul exhorted Timothy to do. To preach the word. Preach the word. This is what the early church did when they met. In Acts chapter 2, those who repented and believed the gospel were baptized and they were added to the church and they were committed to the apostles doctrine the preaching of the word that's the evidence of the grace of god that we as god's people desire to hear the word of god preached that our lives might be transformed by the power of god's spirit into the image of christ so that you will find in lots of parts of the New Testament, you've got instruction, instruction for the church. You get to uh, Ephesians chapter 4, and you've got a, you've got a change. You've been, we've been looking at the gospel in chapters 1, 2, and 3, and then suddenly we're into, this is how we live as churches. This is how we live in our homes. This is how we live in the world. This is how we live at work. The evidence of the grace of God is that we're learning churches. And God has given us the church that we might learn, that we might grow in our faith. It's what Jesus gave himself to. It's what the apostles give, gave, give themselves to. It's what preachers today give themselves to. 
And the evidence of the grace of God is that we're a learning church. There's another evidence of the grace of God here. And that is that the evidence of the grace of God is that churches are linked in fellowship one with another. Churches are linked in fellowship one with another. I like the phrase that, this, that comes in verse 22 now. News of this, news of what was happening in Antioch, reached the ears of the church. Uh, I like that phrase. And uh, the church leaders in Jerusalem want to check it out. And so they send the best person possible, Barnabas. And he goes to see what's happening. And do you notice that they receive him? There's a, there's a, a trust between Jerusalem and Antioch. And then what does Barnabas do? He goes to fetch Saul and brings him and they receive him. And, and there is this link with others. And this link continues. If we were to read on in the book of Acts and saw how Paul and Barnabas were sent out uh, a number of times. Paul was sent out from Antioch. That church was linked in to the churches that he went to through Paul's ministry and Paul's reports. In my first church in um, just outside Coventry, uh, Nanita and I used to attend a minister's meeting in, in uh, Loughborough. The east, it was easier to get to Loughborough, which was further away, than to get into a fraternal in the middle of Birmingham at half past nine in the, in the morning. Uh, so I used to go to the East Midlands and we had good fellowship there between the churches. From churches from time to time would do things together, encourage one another. But nearby was a church where uh, a friend of mine was the pastor, so seven miles away. And we often, often in, in a year, we would um, sometimes meet together on a Sunday evening. We would often meet together for prayer. And if we had a, a speaker that we felt would benefit them. We'd let them know and we'd try to see a time when we could get together to hear of the work of the gospel, perhaps from abroad. He was involved with SGA and often would have people from SGA coming to tell of the work that was going on in Moldova at that time um, in the 1990s. And uh, uh, you can read about it in Celestial Fire if you want to read that book. Um, and, we, and, and we, we joined together for prayer. There, there, was, a, there was a trust between us. Uh, there was a link. That, that is the evidence of the grace of God. That there is that sort of fellowship. That was taken for me a stage further in my last church in Jersey. I was at the FIC ministers conference once. And a friend of mine who was a pastor in an FIC church was responsible for linking churches in the UK to churches in South Carolina. Uh, sorry, in, um, in Mississippi. Mississippi, sorry. Um, I'm getting old. Um, Mississippi. And he sat down at a meal with me and said, Roger, how would you like a team of people to come to Jersey to do a mission with you? And I listened to what he had to say. And then uh, this was November. And, uh, and then I said, OK, OK, I'll, I'll, I'll see. I'll, I'll speak to my church officers when I get back and uh, we'll see what we can do. And as I went back, you have a bit longer to travel sometimes uh, going back to Jersey and um, think about it. And I think, oh, what am I getting the church into? Uh, I don't know these pastors from uh, Mississippi and uh, w what's going to happen? And so I go back and I tell the church officers and they agree. Yes, we should go ahead. And so we plan that the three or four church leaders should come across from Mississippi to us for a weekend. A weekend from Mississippi. Yeah, that was quite a thing. He added it, that impressed us really. Uh, they were keen to come to meet us before they were prepared to say yes. And we were, that's what we wanted as well. And they came to us for a weekend. And we discussed for a weekend whether we could do a mission together, an evangelistic mission. And what was so heartwarming and so thrilling was this, that they said to us, you do all the work, 
You do all the planning, and we'll just come and do everything you tell us to do. Which was great. They didn't come and say, well, this is what we do in Mississippi. They came and they wanted to help us in what we were doing. And we had, uh, I think, three occasions where they came back for a summer, a uh, week and a day, usually. And into that week and a day, we were able to work out a program whereby we brought together those that we ministered to in a month and put it all in a week. And these guys that came over, men and women, the two pastors of the church at the time, came over together and they ministered in all these different locations. And exactly, there was a tremendous sense of laboring together. And then I had the privilege of taking some of my folks out to Mississippi to help them uh, and to see where they were and to fit in with what they were doing. Uh, it was, that's the evidence to, to me of, of, uh, of the grace of God that we could do that uh, together and serve one another <coughs> together. Yes, we, we are thankful for our independency, but we're also thankful that we are to be interdependent with brothers and sisters of like mind. Of like, the evidence of the grace of God is exhibited in a fellowship like the EMW or the FIC. It's exhibited there. That trust in one another, in the unity in the gospel, a linked church. But of course, the evidence of the grace of God is that a church should be a loving church. A loving church. And I think that's what we have here. And I think, in a sense, this explains some of the, the way in which the church at Antioch received Barnabas, received Saul, and then were moved when they heard of their brothers and sisters in Judea who were going to be facing difficulties. This, this prophet Agabus, I think he only appears twice, always interested in people about asking about prophecies in the church. At least, notice these two prophets, the two prophecies that he gives are both bad ones. <laughs> a famine, and one was to Paul, you're going to be in prison. <laughs> Most prophecies that you hear about today are quite different. However, the way in which the church responded to Barnabas, the church responded to Saul, that the way the church responded to their brothers and sisters marks out this church as a loving church. As a loving church. And that's a vital ingredient of the grace of God. The, God has poured his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit. That's the evidence of the grace of God. And that love is to be shared. Love for one another in the fellowship. Love for for other fellowships, love for other church leaders, love for the lost. There's the evidence of the grace of God in, a, in this. A new commandment I give you, said Jesus. By this all men will see that you are my disciples when you love one another. What's the greatest thing that Paul emphasizes as he comes to 1 Corinthians 13 but the greatest is love the greatest is love the evidence of the grace of God is the church is a loving place it's a loving place I remember a lady coming into our service uh, one Sunday uh, in the church and speaking to me afterwards uh, and I went to see her and uh, she said to me, I cannot believe it. it's the first time I've been in church for many years. She was in her late 70s and she'd been attending a, a, a non-evangelical church for many years. And she said, I cannot understand it. Why weren't people gossiping about each other at the end of the service? Because that's what happens at the church I go to. And nobody did that at your church. So I was able to tell her. It's because of the love of God. It's because of the love of Christ towards us and because he has put his love into our hearts. That's the evidence of the grace of God in a local church. That it's a loving church. The evidence of the grace of God is that God gives leaders to a church 
who are gifted and who have grace, the grace of leadership. We have a wonderful example here in Barnabas, who's one of the leaders at the church. This is the evidence of the grace of God, that God provided for the church a good man, an excellent man, an excellent man in character, a sincere man. He was prepared to serve the Lord amongst them, being tested by the church in Jerusalem. He was a good man. He was, he was, he was a genuine, a genuine, clearly uh, set apart for leadership. He was a good man. He was also full of the Holy Spirit. He was mature in the faith. He was gifted by the Holy Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit could be seen in his life. And he was full of faith. Yes, he trusted Christ. He had faith. Yes, he was faithful. He was faithful to the gospel, faithful to the local church in Jerusalem. But I wonder if it's a bit more than that. He was a man who was prepared to go to Antioch. He was prepared to go there. Uh, he was a man a bit like Carey, who expected great things from God and attempted great things for God. He was an example, he was an example to us of, of the leaders that you would find in a church as the evidence of the grace of God. I can remember being talking to some of the mothers who came to our children's work, our mothers and toddlers work, talking about the vicar in the, in the parish where I, I was pastor in the evangelical church and the appalling behavior of the, of the vicar of the church. Whenever he came into school, he had nothing of the love of God about him. Here is something that is the evidence, as it were, of the grace of God in a fellowship, that we're, we're a loving church and we have leaders, we have leaders who are men of integrity. I'm, I have been thrilled with my pastor. I don't know whether this goes out anywhere, but I'm thrilled with him. He's a, he's a man of integrity and he's a man who preaches the word and he's a man who serves. That's the evidence of the grace of God, that God gives such leaders to the church. The evidence of the grace of God is this, that a church is committed to prayer. Church, we only have a, a few verses about the actual church in Antioch, but we can see quite clearly from the, the verses in Acts 13 that the church had a serious attitude towards prayer. They were given to prayer there. We're told the church leaders and the church uh, were given to prayer while they were worshipping the Lord. That includes prayer and fasting. The Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I called them. So after they'd fasted and prayed, they placed their hands on them and set them off. It, it, prayer seems to have been second nature to them in all that they were doing. That's the evidence of the grace of God. I remember being asked in my first church, got into the village and one of the first things I was asked to do to go to a Women's World Day of Prayer in, in one of the local churches. None of the churches had prayer meetings that were there. None of them. Only ours. You see, evidence of the grace of God is that God's people pray because they want to praise God and because they want his help. They want him to be glorified. They want him to intervene. And so an evidence of the grace of God is that a, a church is a praying church, looking to God in prayer, looking to God in prayer. That's the evidence of the grace of God. Even the, the poet Tennyson said on one occasion, more things are wrought by prayer than this world ever dreamed. The evidence of the grace of God is that a church is a praying church. The evidence of the grace of God is that a church is longing for others to come to know Jesus. You notice how the church begins with people coming to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ in verse 21, a great number of people. And then Barnabas preaches and we're told at the end of verse 24, and a great number of people brought to the Lord, he's continuing to preach the gospel. This church has a longing for people to be saved. And then they have a longing for people to be saved abroad. 
and they're, so they're praying about the work of the gospel in chapter 13 in other parts of the world. They have a longing for others to come to know and love the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the evidence of the grace of God. The church that has the evidence of the grace of God will become like Jesus. This was the church that the believers were first called Christians in Antioch. They were first called Christians. Here were these people who, because of God's grace in their lives, were becoming more and more like Jesus. I remember hearing a reading story of two missionaries in China and they were teaching at this particular time a group of people in the open air, a group of people around them, and uh, teaching them about the life of Jesus, how he lived. And someone interrupted them and said, just a minute, I know someone, I, I know that person, I know that person. Could not say, I, I know somebody like, no, I know that person. And it didn't matter how much the missionaries tried to say, no, I'm, I'm talking about Jesus. Uh, no, I, I'm insisting. That, and, and they took him, at the end of the meeting, they took the missionaries to a village. And as they approached this, this house in the village, they noticed that even the, the ground around the house was cultivated. And, and they come and they meet this man who is a believer in Christ and who had so impressed at least one person in the community that he'd be, he was becoming like Jesus. He was evidencing Jesus by the way he lived, by the way he responded, by the way he acted, by the way he spoke. The evidence of the grace of God is that a church becomes more and more like Jesus. And finally, I want to just say a word about the phrase that we used at the beginning, as it were. Verse 21, the Lord's hand was with them and a great number of people believed and turned to the Lord. My dear friends, the Lord's hand is always with his church as the gospel is being preached. And the church is being the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. These characteristics that are being grown, as it were, in the lives of God's people, because really what I'm saying here is, is that each one of us as part of a local church are responsible for how the evidence of the grace of God is seen. The Lord's hand, the Lord's work through the preaching of the word in the lives of men and women. The Lord's hand was with them. Their gospel success was God's work. God's work. The Lord's hand transforming lives by the power of his spirit through the word. Salvation is of the Lord. But I want to just say, rather than a characteristic to close with, that we close, as it were, with a desire for more. A desire for more. What we see here is we see not only the Lord's hand with ones and twos and threes and fours. We see here the Lord's hand doing great, greater things. Many coming to faith. I live in a village of 2,000 people just outside Welshpool. It's a very vibrant village, I've learned, as I've been only living there for two years, we, my wife and I. It's very vibrant. It's, it's got a school. It's got a church and a chapel. The, the gospel isn't preached there, but there is a church and a chapel. There's a community of people who go there. There's two community centres. Uh, there's a choir. Uh, there's a football team. Uh, there's a cricket team. There are bowls going on. There's it, all in this one community. Uh, I probably hasn't named everything. And um, because of COVID, people used to walk past our house a lot with their dogs or for exercise, and we'd speak to each other. And as COVID has passed, I've talked to people more and more, just got to know them. I think I know the names of about 25 people that um, live in our village. 
and I've sought to seek to remember them. Uh, because reading a book recently uh, challenged me. I read uh, Faith Cook's book, a biography of William Grimshaw, an Anglican minister in the 18th century, and I can hear people saying, oh, 18th century again. Yes, but he preached in one church. Uh, after moving, he, he actually moved from, from one church where he'd been converted when he was in the ministry, and very shortly afterwards moved to Haworth and found there a company of people whom he numbered as 12 in his, from his village of 2,000 people. This is what interested me. His village was 2,000 people, exactly the same as Gillsfield. And he began with a, a, a company of people who came to communion with 12 people. Within 10 years, he was having 1,200 come to communion. Now that also is the Lord's hand. <laughs> oh, but he did preach a lot during that time. He, he, he tells of his lazy week being, uh, I'm ashamed, I'm ashamed almost to say it when I think back over my ministry. His lazy week was 12 times during the week preaching in homes in outlying districts from Haworth. He would say to someone on Sunday, I'm at your home on Monday. And he would go and preach and expect the person to invite their friends and their neighbours to come and preach. Of course, in those days, the minister had some standing in the community. Um, that was his lazy week. His busy week was 20 to 30 times. It's no wonder he died in his 50s, dry, uh, riding on horseback. I, I, I was trying to get John to let me come up on Saturday nights, stay the nights from Welshpool, uh, coming in my car. And then realized how silly I was when I came up this morning and I could have been here in an hour and a half and uh, I, I took my time and uh, but he went out and preached the gospel preached it was hard work in all weathers and the Lord's hand was with him my dear friends we uh, he is our God <laughs> he's our God and as you and I go out into our week whatever our week is our God is able to do more than we can ever ask or think.